from the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, Outdoor Oklahoma. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Over the past few years, you've no doubt become more aware of the many problems that invading zebra mussels are having on lakes across the country. And today, we'll follow along with biologists as they conduct critical zebra mussel research right here in Oklahoma. But first, can you remember what you were doing the first weekend of December, say 25 years ago? <laughs> well, probably not, but if you were to ask one of the lifelong friends in our first segment, they could tell you exactly what they were doing. A core group of friends have been spending that first weekend of December camping out along and fishing at the Blue River in South Central Oklahoma for nearly three decades. We'll tag along and find out that it's more than trout on a line that keeps them coming back year after year. The beauty of this place is really uh, unbelievable for here in Oklahoma. You look at this river and the beauty of the falls, I mean, it's just like a little piece of Colorado in Oklahoma. The scenery is just a different experience, clear, cold river and the trees and the rocks. It's just a really spectacular place and we just got hooked on it. If the fishing's good, just a bonus. I'd come down here if I didn't even catch fish. The core of our group has come for 20 to 25 years together. We just make it a, we come twice a year, sometimes more often than that. It is just one of those things that, it's, it's something you look forward to every year, and it's, it's something that after a few years you accumulate what you need to do it and stay out in the cold and deal with the bad weather and things like that. Well, David, 25, 30 years ago, he told me about this place, and we, uh, we came down, just started camping here, and we've been doing it uh, every year since. We started out, three or four of us, and uh, there was a time when it just uh, progressed to be too big of a camp, but the, the core of our group has continued to come for 20 to 25 years. Blue River Camping. Yeah. I don't want you picking up that piece of potato and throwing it back in the middle. I've got some jelly too, if anybody wants jelly. I mean, the camp thing is just, it's a really good time. Everybody gets together and just visits and you know, you don't have the distractions of like TV and people coming and going and stuff like that. And it's, it's just, it's just really nice to just sit around and just visit for a change because a lot of people don't do that anymore. You know, they just they sit around, watch TV, don't say a lot to each other. You know, it's just, it's a real good time to get reacquainted with your friends. For an angler that's never experienced the Blue River, it's a really unique spot in Oklahoma. Uh, there aren't many rivers in South Central Oklahoma that, that look like the Blue River. It looks, it looks almost misplaced. It looks like it could be in Colorado or one of the western states. Uh, you're going to find a lot of granite outcroppings, a lot of uh, waterfalls associated with those, and you're going to find a lot of different pool and riffle habitats around those waterfalls. It can be pretty rough terrain. We have we have six and a quarter miles, so there's lots of places they can explore. Uh, you'll find lots of braided channels. There'll be places where, you know, the channel splits into six different distinguishable chutes. So, uh, you know, if, if a 
person wants to get out and explore a good pair of hip boots or a good pair of waders or something, a, a good idea to bring. But we also have areas that are very accessible uh, to people with special needs or people that you know just want to come out with the kids for a day. We also have lots of lots of easy bank access for those people. Camping is very popular. Uh, this is really a great destination for camping in this area. All of our campsites are primitive. There, there are no hookups. So it's a good place to come and get away uh, to the quietness of, of nature. Uh, we have lots of, lots of areas where you can camp away from people, kind of if you want to bring your family down to kind of be in a, in a setting that, that makes you feel like you're uh, really out in the wilderness. It's, it's a good place to do that. My first recollection was I saw a story on the news about fishing down here and I wasn't aware of it and that was back in the early 80s. And my brother and I drove down here for a day trip and fished for a little while and if I remember correctly, David and I talked about it and we decided to come down here and camp and we, David Allen and I uh, began camping here in the early 80s. We weren't even really aware that there was even trout fishing available in Oklahoma and we decided we'd come down here and, and see what was going on. A lot of people think we're crazy for coming down here when it's cold in the winter and stuff, but you know, if you're ready for it and, and you're prepared to deal with it, it's really not that bad. And quite honestly, the colder it gets, the less people show up, the more quiet it is. And I mean, it's just a very peaceful, quiet place. It's, it's a good camaraderie for the guys. You know, it's a good guy time. And it's been a learning curve all the way through how to deal with the cold, how to catch the fish, what to do as you progress. Camping in the winter is a lot different experience than in the summer, but and a lot of people think it's silly, but in a lot of respects it's a lot nicer. There's, you don't deal with a lot of things you deal with in the with the hot weather, the insects, snakes, things of that nature aren't something you have to deal with up here this time of year. We've come down here and been skunked before, and more than once, if truth be known. But really, it's uh, really just the whole area. The, the, uh, the park is real clean, it's real nice. Uh, uh, the camping is uh, uh, it's not real crowded. You feel like uh, you, you're kind of secluded, uh, and it's just a relaxation. Well, I hope I'm healthy enough to do it 25 more years. <laughs> but whether it's cold or whether it's warm or the fishing is good or it's not good, I've just never had a bad day at the Blue River. It's just a really enjoyable place to go and a real relaxed place to camp and fish. I got two girls. I brought them down here. We've come down in the summer sometimes and just hang out and camp. They just love it here. It's just so beautiful. It's just nice. And I mean, as, as time goes by, obviously, you know, that the younger kids get their little crowd together and, you know, they start making their own little camps and they get their camp gear together. So it's kind of a unique, neat deal because it's kind of like passing it on, you know, to another generation, you know, and, and it's really kind of a neat deal. It really is. It's pretty much, I, I don't see ever not coming down here. I think this is this is a pattern that that I hope and pray that uh, uh, continues uh, until I'm just physically unable to do it. Uh, the camaraderie with uh, with our buddies. Uh, we just uh, we have uh, my sons down here now, and we've got uh, other other guys' sons are coming down here now and bringing their friends. So really turned into quite a tradition and like I said I uh, as long as I'm physically able to come down here and do this uh, I plan on doing it and hopefully that's going to be a, a long time to come.
zebra mussels seem to be in the news more and more every year, and concerned boaters and anglers' hearts sink every time a report is released that yet another lake has been infected. Well, today we're going to take a look at some of the important research on zebra mussels that's being conducted right here in Oklahoma and find ways to help you prevent spreading zebra mussels to more lakes. We're at Broken Bow Lake in McCurtain County. I'm here along with the Fish and Wildlife Service. We're pulling water samples from the lake to uh, test for zebra mussels. Zebra mussels are a small, tiny bivalve mussel. Um, it's an invasive species that we have in some lakes here in Oklahoma. And so what we're doing is, is kind of a, an early detection program. This year we're sampling 18 lakes statewide. And these are all lakes that are not confirmed with zebra mussels at this point. Um, the reason we we choose the lakes that we do is because we choose lar larger lakes that get a lot of boat traffic um, where zebra mussels are most likely to be introduced. They aggregate on structures in very high numbers and they're also filter feeders. So they filter out a lot of nutrients from the water that the juvenile fish and other um, species of wildlife depend on. Zebra mussels were first discovered in the United States in 1984 in the Great Lakes system. It's um, theorized that they had been sh transported from the Caspian Sea region via ballast water in large ocean-going vessels, then established in, great, in the Great Lakes, and from the Great Lakes they've spread throughout the United States. Zebra mussels were first discovered in Oklahoma in 1992 in the Kerr-McClellan Navigation Way, and since that time they've spread to other water bodies in the state, and they can be an immense problem they um, become so dense that they'll weigh down docks. They become so dense that they clog water inlet pipes and thereby costing um, water users more and more money to clean them, to remove them, to treat them annually. The best method for, for dealing with these would be to prevent the spread of them. That's why it's important for Oklahoma's boaters and water users to be cognizant of the dangers of, of spreading zebra mussels. So I'm here with Clayton Porter with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and he has here a plankton net. This is what we use to test for zebra mussel larvae, also known as villagers. Um, this net here is just a hoop, hoop net style and um, very fine mesh material. This stuff's 63 microns, so very tiny. It allows the water to get filtered through the net, but it captures any um, plankton or zebra mussel villagers or any other algae or material that's in the water. One of the reasons why we chose this site was because it's easy for us to access deep water. And uh, one of the ways that zebra mussels get introduced is through, uh, through boats. And so if we're gonna find large numbers of villagers, this might be a good spot to look. And we've got a weight attached to it and that'll help it sink down. And once he, while he's pulling that net up, It'll actually filter that water out and collect any villagers if they are present in this lake. A villager is just basically a juvenile um, zebra mussel, so it's the hatchlings. Um, they're free-floating, kind of planktonic, and um, that's what we'll actually look for in our water sample when we go back to the lab. How deep was that sample? 14 and a half meters. 14 and a half, so that's right about where we want. We've got at least 14 meters. Um, Clayton's gonna bring that over here, and we're gonna go ahead and drain the sample into this collection bottle. Just by opening the valve there, and we'll just allow that sample to dump in. So now that we've emptied the majority of the sample into the bottle, we still wanna rinse this down and make sure we get anything that's attached to the net. So I'm just using uh, DI water to rinse this down. Make sure that guy's in there. Okay, and once we've got that thoroughly rinsed, 
Then we're going to add some ethanol to this to preserve the sample and we'll take it back to the lab for analysis. Once zebra mussels get introduced, there's really no reversing that. And so, you know, outreach and education is the main tool that we use to try to inform boaters and anglers on what to do. If you know about invasive species, zebra mussels in particular, spread the word because that's how we can stop the spread. I'm here with Clayton Porter at the Fisheries Resource Office in Tishomingo. Um, several months ago, we pulled some water samples out of Broken Bow Reservoir to test for zebra mussel larvae, which are called villagers. Um, now we're back in the lab. We've got the water sample. We're going to pull the water sample out using the microscope. We're going to look for these villagers and see if we can detect some. Um, so Clayton, if you want to go ahead and run us through the process with how we analyze a, wat a water sample, what we're looking for, how we distinguish zebra mussels from uh, other organisms that might be in there. As Curtis mentioned earlier, here's the sample that we took from Broken Bow. We have our microscope set up here. We use a technique called cross-polarization. This allows us to look at these samples in a different, different lighting setting so that we can distinguish these zebra mussel villagers, which are very, very small organisms, and distinguish those from other organisms that's found throughout the water column. So here's an actual still photo that we took from Lake Texoma, which is a known positive for zebra mussels. This photo right here was uh, taken with our microscope without the use of cross-polarization. So this next picture I got here is with cross-polarization. As you can see right here, this is, this is a zebra mussel. It's, it's the white, real bright white against a dark background with the distinguishable X shape on it. Once again, here's the same picture without the polarization. And this right here is clearly the zebra mussel when it's referenced back to the previous picture. So this picture right here is a, a really good picture of what exactly we're looking for when we're using the microscopy technique to identify these villagers. So this right here helps us when we're, when we're distinguishing villagers from other organisms uh, in the water column. This technique uh, is a fairly easy technique to do, but there are some, some, some drawbacks to it. There's, there's other organisms in the water that will reflect what we call birefringence. Uh, that's their shells showing this X on their shell, such as an ostracod, a corbicula, or Asian clam. Uh, so we have to use a, uh, an ocular micrometer, which measures in, in microns. So that, that is the way that we distinguish a zebra mussel villager from other organisms that are found in the water. So you want to go ahead and pull a water sample out and, and show us exactly how we look at it? Okay, so we got our broken bow sample here. I'm going to take a 10 milliliter sample of this and apply it to this petri dish. Keep in mind, um, cross-contamination is a big factor here. We don't want to contaminate samples, so you can see everything's labeled properly. Um, that way we can keep our samples separate and we're not worrying about any false positives or, or things like that. So looking at this sample, we didn't find any villagers in there, but we like to take multiple subsamples from the water that we took from Broken Bow. So I'll go ahead and do the next one and see if we find anything in there. When we were out on the lake, we pulled water samples from several locations on the lake, compiled all those samples into this bottle, and so now Clayton is pulling subsamples out of that to analyze. So it just kind of gives us some repetition and uh, reinforces the fact that there, there may not be anything in there. So after looking at multiple subsamples, uh, I think we're pretty good to say that uh, Broken Bow's a, a clean lake and it's looking good and zebra mussel free as of right now. Yeah. So this early detection method is very effective. We're able to, to test the lakes and see if there's anything in there. But remember, as, as good stewards, to, to wash your boats, trailers, equipment, so that we're not spreading zebra mussels around to any other water bodies. Well, thanks for joining us today. To find out more information about camping and fishing the Blue River area, or on ways to prevent spreading zebra mussels, log on to our website at wildlifedepartment.com. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.